Granny used to tell me all the time Sparks when feats and preparation combine The road been right here all this time But you gotta look with more than your eyes And the small axe Jesse Ryle representing for I just star mindset Rich forever Blessed love, pleasant, good evening, good afternoon Warm welcome Mindset program. I just tell me a host and I want to greet the item officially in the divine name of His Imperial Majesty Emperor El Selassie I the First, Empress Menin the First, Holy Manuel I, King Selassie I Ja, Rastafari. One more day above ground, beautiful viewers and subscribers. And as the item know, say life is our ultimate position, you know. No matter what I go on, all right? All our I go on, life is still our ultimate position. So, we give thanks for that. And um, we have a special guest on the program today. And um, I guess that we have, you know, very recent on the program, you know. And I'm telling you, it was a very um, powerful, powerful program, I must say. And you know, and it's a great honor, you know, to to have the honorable empress again, and um, the platform, the honorable empress that we're talking about is um, honorable empress Marina from the Ethiopia Africa Black International Congress, and um, without no further delay, I want to introduce her to. The platform again. Blessed love, Honorable Empress. My Lord Majesty, blessed love. Rastafari. Good to have the eye again upon the platform. Yes, my Lord. Good to be here. Yes, I. The eye sound a little bit low. Is it, all right. I'll speak up. I will. Um. All right. Yes, right. I'll speak up. I'll raise my voice. Yes. Yeah, that yeah, that sounds good still. Yeah, man. Yeah, there I don't have to shout. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes, Honorable Empress. Yeah, man. Good for have there again. Um, it's an honor and a privilege. You know what I mean to you know to have you, um, with us, to. To reason and um, you know, to reason and your. Your profession, if I must say, and you know the who the eye is really. You know, in 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 the movement of Rastafari, and you know what they I, you know, do for you know the movement of Rastafari. So, you know, it's it's you know it's great to have the eye again. You know that the eye could yes, share yes, with the masses at large. Yes. Well, I remember the last time I was on, you had asked the question as to how I came into Rastafari. Yes, I. And um, I yes, and I'd I'd provide you with an answer, but I wanted to elaborate on that, if I may. Right. So I learned of Rastafari culture, Baba Shanti culture in particular, um, in about 1979 or so, and I learned it from my kingman, priest, priest board. Mm -hmm. Um. However, um, he he in turn learned it from a brethren by the name of Priest Aikil. He learned of the culture. He heard of Baba Shanti culture through Priest Aikil. Now, Priest Aikil is not very active in the Congress, at, you know, now at this time. But at that time, I'm telling you, he was like a front row, you know, a forerunner. He, you know, he learned of the culture. Um, he had another bird by the name of Brandel. Um, he learned of the culture, and then they brought the culture to New York back in the late 70s. And so I am telling you, there are about 30 people that we can say um, Priest Aikil was directly responsible for those people coming into Baba Shanti. And that include my Kingman priest board. See. We're talking about Priest Campbell, Priest Wee, Priest Courtney, Priest Knuckles, Priest Nappy, Priest Glass, Priest Itafa, Priest Turks, Priest Dreadcraft, Priest Diego, Priest Gabby, Priest Michael, Ja Eddie, Priest Icom. You understand all of those brethren and more. And then now the empresses and children to boot, you know, the empresses of those brethren. Priest, I am telling you, Priest Aikil is to Bobo Shanti what St. Paul was to Christianity. 
in terms of proselytizing and bringing people into the faith. You okay. understand me? Into the culture. Yes, and as I said, he doesn't get he does get that kind of accolade. He doesn't get that kind of recognition. But he really is responsible. If people are to be truthful, he is he's responsible for bringing a, a whole host of I and I into Baba Shanti culture. And in fact, when we went to the foundation with 1980-81, it was, you know, the largest influx of people coming into the Congress, um, you know, at Bobo Hill. And once again, as I said, he was the architect of that. He was the one who brought us all in, you know, through coming to New York and spreading the culture. So, um, you know, and, and he has also, over the years, he has been very instrumental. You know, the first copy of the Black Supremacy, he was involved in that. You know, he used to contribute heavily financially to the Congress, him and Priest Diego and others. You know, um, the first Delco system and things like that, they brought to the Congress. See. But um, oftentimes they won't hear that about him. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. He'll he'll be bad-mouthed and things like that. I You know, I spoke to him earlier this year. And, you know, he, and I'm telling you, he's, he's very intelligent. He's very, you know, very intelligent, very charismatic. And, you know... And I, I'm, you know, I'm glad that, you know, I'm, I've been talking to him from time to time because one of my sons, you know, kind of moved with him a lot. So, um, on account of that, you know, we'll, um, interact with him. But um, I, I wanted to say that, right, so he was responsible for bringing so many of us into Bumbershan culture. I'm telling you, no fewer than 30 people and maybe, oh, and maybe a whole lot more. Yes, 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 yes. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. But um, yes, he would sir. also, yeah, man. If, he, if he'd be willing, he'd, he'd be a good person to interview. Very knowledgeable, you know, and as I said, intelligent and charismatic. Yes, he'd be a good person to interview, my lord. Well, the floor is is, yes. is, is, is here for him, you know, anytime. <laughs> yes. yes, 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 my lord. Yes, I. So the the the, the I came into Rastafari due to um, priest I kill, due well, to priest, the, well, my, my, yeah, due my, to yeah, the my king man, man learned, yeah. yes, True. right, heard, learned it from him, and then obviously taught it to me. Natural, natural, you know? natural. So that that is how um, that is how I came into Bobo Shanti culture, and, and this, I did not. I didn't live on the foundation for a very long time. Only about two years, mm. and then I came back to New back to New York, and then I started. I started to work. Then I started going to school, and um, you know, and eventually, I became an attorney, and um, I have been practicing, you know, immigration law, in New York for quite some time. No, wow. I chose immigration. Well, actually, immigration chose me because you know. In America, there are roughly about 36 different areas of law, right? And I was actually, when I first started out, I was doing estates. Um, and then someone from my mom's church contacted me about an immigration issue, and I started researching it, and I became, you know, I became interested in it. And so um, and so that's how I got in the, in the field of immigration, in the area of immigration law. Now, as I've said to you, so I hinted on the last program that... Um, yeah. You know, people think that immigration law is, is um, simple and straightforward. Mm. And that is why I took the opportunity to send you two samples. And I don't know if you've had a chance to look at them, but samples of two types of, um, re, you know, legal opinion letters that we, you know, send out, or that we have sent out to two clients, people who are seeking immigration advice regarding their particular situation. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I you know, especially read, people who have had a. Re yeah, mm -hmm. I did read. I, I I did read. Um, both of them. Um, the second one was very extraordinary. Still, to be honest, you know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So people have situations. So these are the types of situations. So whereas people may um, you know, wrongfully believe that okay, well, immigration law is about um, filling out forms. Oh, it is so. If you only knew litigation the amount of litigation that is involved in immigration law for one thing um it intersects with um it's very complex and judges have said that repeatedly for example you have um you have criminal law and the criminal laws have been on the books since 18 whatever 
right? And they have largely remained the same. Mm -hmm. They have been tweaked over the years, but immigration law is a very vibrant area of law and it is constantly changing. Um, and it, then, then it intersects with um, different departments. For example, the US Department of Homeland Security is responsible for immigration law. But immigration law intersects with, um, with you know, the US Department of Justice comes into play, the US Department of State, US Department of Labor, US Department of Education, Department of Agriculture, Department of Health, because there are so many different aspects to immigration law. You are, um, because even within immigration law, I only practice in a particular area. I do VAWA, which is the um, domestic violence. I do U visa, which is just regular, um, you know, violence, not necessarily domestic violence. Then I do deportation, and we, uh, you know, and our mainstay is the family-based um, petition, okay. right? Is a family, family, family-based immigration. I don't do employment-based. I don't do the the the, um, the non the non-immigrant visas like sports and entertainment and things like that. I don't do those. We do um, our, our our office. We do family law, and we do um, deportation cases. That's where we focus. And obviously, in the in the area of deportation, we have to um, interact with criminal defense attorneys to sort of guide them and give them, um, you know, legal opinions as to what types of plea an alien may be able to take that would um, cause them the least amount of a harm. From an immigration perspective you know so a lot of times we'll find that criminal defense attorneys while they're representing their clients they'll reach out to us for a legal opinion and say listen um counsel this is what the the, the, the district attorney you know the, the prosecutor is offering and can my client take this plea if he takes this plea what are the immigration ramifications of such a plea because the client is obviously a great when you're a citizen, you're immune from deportation. Once you become a naturalized citizen of the U.S., you are immune from deportation, no matter what kind of crime you may commit, right? So maybe only in very extreme cases, you may, you know, there may be a denaturalization where you can lose your citizenship, but that has more to do with you joining a foreign army against the United States. Extreme actions like that, but not just committing any um, a crime. You yeah. can no longer be subjected to deportation once you become a naturalized citizen of the United States. But insofar as you remain a green card holder, which is a lawful permanent resident, you can be um, deported from the United States um, for the commission of a crime. And even if you're not a green card holder, right, if you have any criminal convictions, that also affects you in terms of your admissibility into the United States and, you know, whether or not you qualify for a green card because you have, there are certain types of convictions that automatically disqualifies you permanently from ever getting a, um, a green card. And, uh, you know, murder, committing murder after a certain date, right? You're permanently um, barred from getting a green card. Also drug convictions, drug convictions. Now, it's interesting that if you have a manslaughter, manslaughter charge, you can get a green card, but if you have a murder charge, you cannot. So that not all killings are equal, right? It depends on how the, the killing is Because not all killing is murder. Some are, you know, self-defense, some is manslaughter, some is negligent, you know, mm. or homicide. So, you know, it's the intent that, um, it, you know, so you have to, even, even that, you have to look and see you know how it, what type, what the charges were, so forth and so on, to determine whether or not it operates as a permanent bar to um, your client getting a green card. Now, what I another thing I want to say is that um, you know law is art; it is not science. So things it's not written in stone the way people would think. You know, so and law you have to be clever as a lawyer. You have to be clever and you have to push arguments. Right. Sure. Remember, the, 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 the legal system is an adversarial system. And so um, one side is saying this. Now, remember, you know, the same set of facts, the same statute or law and the same set of facts. And you have two lawyers duking it out and they are saying the exact opposite of what each other is saying. And that's what people do not understand. It doesn't mean one is right and one is wrong. It means that they are putting forward right they're putting forward their argument in support of their their position or their client's position right 
right? Because even in a criminal defense, in a, in a criminal case, the defendant is saying not guilty and the prosecutor is trying to prove that the defendant is guilty of the crime that is charged. So they're saying they, they're at opposite end of the spectrum. And that is the nature of law. And people do not understand. A lot of times people don't understand. So, and they may think that, oh, well, this lawyer is not so bright. This lawyer is not so good because, you know, they're making certain types of argument. But let me tell you something, lawyers are really quite clever because things that may seem obvious to, um, you know, a lay person, it's mm -hmm. not so obvious to a lawyer because we realize that no is just the starting point. No is just the opening salvo. No, you understand me? No is, the, no is an invitation, a discussion and debate. <laughs> right? And just because somebody is saying something, you know, opposite to your position doesn't mean that that, that, that person is, is right and you're wrong. For example, judges disagree among themselves all the time. Right? Judges. Right? So we can agree, right? The highest court in the United States is the U.S. Supreme Court. And there are nine very bright people, right? That that court is comprised of very bright people, right? And yet still they disagree. They disagree in the interpretation of statute, in the way that the facts are, um, present. They they disagree. And so you have different types of decisions. So you'll see the United States Supreme Court, it comes down with a decision. And um, no, it's great when it's a unanimous decision. All the judges agree and they agree for the same reason then you have something known as majority opinion right, right. A, a majority decision it means the majority say one thing and the minority say no we disagree with you then you have plurality right where they may you know some people agree some people disagree and they they agree for different reasons i believe it should be decided this way because so and so and so so they agree but they agree on different legal grounds, different reasons, different argument. Yes. And then, of course, you have the dissenting opinion because the, the people who said we absolutely disagree with the way that the majority has decided the case. We think they're wrong. We think it should be this way. So that is why when people try to point out, like, you know, as if you said, this lawyer, you know, didn't do that or didn't do that. People, you know, it's not it's not that easy. Right. For example, even um, as I said, among the, 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 the justices, of the Supreme Court, they disagree all the time. In within the United States, the same law again and the same statute can be interpreted differently in different jurisdictions, different circuits. For example, I am in New York. We're in New York, so our our cases, if they go up, they go up to the Second Circuit because the um, New York is you know falls under the Second Circuit. There are thirteen circuit courts in the United States. 13 different jurisdictions and New York falls under the, um, the second circuit. So we can, so in, in the second circuit, I can have a case in the second circuit and it's decided one way, right? The precedent in the second circuit is one way. And then when you go to the ninth circuit, go to California, that same case, would, that same case, same set of facts, same law would be decided differently in the ninth circuit or maybe the 11th circuit down in Florida or the third circuit in Pennsylvania or the fourth circuit in Maryland. So there's that diversity once again. So, and it's not a matter of right and wrong. It's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of perspective. So isn't no, it- No, I've been doing this, hmm? Isn't it one law that govern um, um, the entire um, United States? Or there are two laws? Well, well, okay, so you have federal law, you have state law, right? Okay. But immigration is federal law. But I'm saying it's the interpretation. You can have different interpretations of the same statute. This, I have had people, I have had to move people. So a client comes to me and he's in Pennsylvania on a third circuit. And I said, I want you in second circuit. Because the history of that law, that statute in the second circuit is more favorable to you than it is in the third circuit, Pennsylvania. So I need you to get a New York address. Okay. So we can, we, yes. So, so once again, as I said, you can have different interpretation of the same statute in different parts of the country. It's the same law. It's the same law, same statute. But, but that, it is given a different interpretation in different jurisdictions, different circuits. But, and so it, that is part of your practice, you know, your practice as a lawyer is to, you know, you mm -hmm. have to be strategic. Mm -hmm. You have to be strategic. And I am proud to say that I have done quite well in my many years of practice, well, uh, and um, I'm going to do a little bit of um, 
hosting now because <laughs> well, um, during those uh, over 20 years in practice i've gotten so many god bless yous i've gotten thank yous i've gotten many gifts including a very expensive scarf from one of my russian clients i've gotten jewelry and chocolate from one of my middle eastern clients and let me tell you something i've even, i've gotten three marriage proposals over the years wow <laughs> um there was a man who was um deported um he had been deported and then um he let his family he had been deported to jamaica his family learned of me and they came to see me his mother and his brother and i said let me see the papers and i looked at it and i said i believe i can bring him back and i brought him back and when he got back he came straight to my office and he married to me now and i said to him sir i'm already married please <laughs> um but i mean i'm telling you over the years i have got so i have so many people no i'm not telling you you know i'm not performing heart surgery here so i'm not saving lives in that way mm. but but we are saving lives True. people who have been stuck in a rut mm -hmm. you understand you you know if to, to to live in a country um undocumented can be quite stressful yeah, man. i have seen people break down and cry people just um people who are, have been separated from their children for many years long periods of time i had um about two years ago i had a, such a situation a woman said she had left she left jamaica when she was 27 years old and her son was nine months old when she was leaving and she was now in her 60s and had never gone back she had tried various things and her case was just very convoluted and complicated and i was able to unravel that case i said to her it's not going to be fast but give me a little time and i unraveled that case and that woman got her green card i, I put the case down in north carolina because i knew that i could get a better um result down there understand mm -hmm. and she had an address down there where her husband was living and so that is where i filed the application and when the case was called on in north carolina we flew down the morning to attend the interview and it was approved on the spot and um and i'm telling you it, it's such it's such a good feeling when you're able to help people in this way when you're able to the, so the woman now can you know has her status she can travel to jamaica she can go and see her son you know whom she has not you know except for you know on social media and mm. things like that and these are the types of things that we do we had another case again where another man who was also deported from the u.s big drug conviction and his parents his mom and dad came to see me and they said to me that you know he was deported however many years ago for drugs and this and i said to them drug conviction is one of those things that you can't come back from you understand and um you know this and i said but anyway let me take the file give me the file and let me take a look at it and so i looked at the file and i said but this man shouldn't have been deported in the first place i said did he have an, an attorney when he was in deportation did he have an attorney and they said yes and i said but he shouldn't have been deported because he's a u.s citizen so um i mm -hmm. i put together the package and i wrote the letter to the u.s consulate and i told him i said take this to the to the u.s consulate in kingston jamaica and go to the u.s citizen section and hand them this letter and if he did this did that he handed them a letter because i have outlined why you know how he derived citizenship from his parents he, because he was a kid when he came to the u.s and so he um yeah he derived citizenship through his parents and they issued him the um i said issue him a u.s passport forthwith and that is exactly what they did and then his children know they got the birth abroad to u.s because he had children who were born in jamaica and the man is you know back in the united states and so let me tell you my lord prophet i just star yes, what sir. i have is like a cult following it's a cult following okay we have a turn down cases a woman came into my office the other day <laughs> and she said to me, she said to me she, you know she was supposed to sit she sat on the chair first then she got up right away she put her hands right at her side she stood up against the wall she said miss blake them tell me about you you know them tell me there's a little woman down in a manhattan they go to her 
She said, tell me, sir, there's no plane you can land, no ship you can dock, no case mm-hmm. you can win. I said to her, I said, mom, I said, that is urban legend. <laughs> I said, there is no lawyer who has won every, every one of his or her cases. And I said, any lawyer who tells you that is a liar or he has not, not been practicing for very long. Mm. You understand? There's no lawyer who can say that never lost a case. True. You understand? No, you, I mean, yeah, a good average to say, listen, I win 90% of my cases. I win 95% of my cases, whatever the case may be. But there's no lawyer who can tell you I have never lost a case, especially when they're just starting out. You understand me? And learning the ropes. So, um, right. So I'm not going to sell anybody, you know, that sort of that dream, that pipe dream. Like there's no case that I can't. Of course, there are cases that um, are just, they're impossible because, you know, you're stuck with the facts. Yeah. The facts took place long before the person came to you and you can't change the facts. No, you can sort of massage the facts and try to put it, you know, present it in the best light possible. But you um but you can't you can't um you know you can't change it. What um what what my skill is, I'm a very strong writer. I'm a very strong writer. And um so uh, most of the times, you know, judges don't even hear oral arguments because cases are won or lost on the papers alone. And even with immigration, you know, you're getting um, you know, when I write to my cover letter, when I'm filing um, a petition for a person, um, you know, then I make my my case, you know, outline my case, and um, they will read it. I have gone to immigration interviews with clients, and the office, the interviewing officer said to me, "Counsel, can we use your memorandum of law in our training session because it is so well written? Wow, it is so on point." I had a case in Jamaica. I had a case in Jamaica several years ago, maybe about uh, 10 years ago or so. And there's this kid. Now, there's, the, the father is here in the United States. And he has no status. He's married to a U.S. citizen, right? She has not filed for him because, quite frankly, he has a huge drug conviction. And he cannot get a green card. But his wife can file for his son. The man had a so I said, well, then have your wife file for the son. That's her stepson under the law because the law recognizes stepchildren as children, right? Mm-hmm. So your step, his stepmother is now going to file for him. She's a U.S. citizen. So we, you know, she filed. The petition is approved. The case now goes to, um, you know, National Visa Center, which in turn, you know, puts it, you know, sends it to the um, U.S. Embassy in Kingston. So the, the kid, the 15-year-old boy, he's calling for an interview at the embassy. So he got to the embassy now and the interview officer said to him, he wants evidence of a relationship between this boy and his stepmother. So he's asking for pictures to show that the stepmother has met the child. The stepmother has come to Jamaica to visit the child. He wants to see evidence of them communicating, you know, you know, um, phone records or maybe social media Mm. they are you know he wants to see evidence of the step relationship in depth and that he yes and then he gave the client my client he said he gave him a month by which to gather those um those documents and the evidence and bring it back when my client after the interview my client calls me and he you know he's relaying to me what took place right he was there with his guardian i said to him not to, so he said, Miss Blake, so what should I start gathering now? I said, not to worry. So I wrote a letter to the officer in Kingston because I know the officer is wrong. Um, but obviously, I'm not going to insult the officer, right? Mm-hmm. He's wrong, but I'm going to point out that he's wrong in a respectable way. I said to him, dear officer, right, I have searched 8 USC. I have diligently searched 8 CFR. I have searched the INA, the FAM, the AFM. I've looked at case law and I can find no statute, no law, no rule, no regulation that requires the documents that you are requesting from my client in connection with this type of petition. So if you would be so kind as to give me the citation, right? Give me the citation for the case or the statute upon which your your request is based. 
and because I know that I know that no such statute exists. Mm-hmm. You understand? But I'm not going to say to him, "Oh, you're wrong." I just said, if you could just point me, per- perhaps I may have overlooked. Well, he never he didn't respond to me in terms of giving me the citation. He simply wrote me back and said, "Counsel, please tell your client to come in for the, to pick up his visa." Because he was wrong. There's no such requirement under the law. You're, you're, you don't have to know your step parent. You'd never have to make, have met them. There has to be no relationship between you and your step parent in order for your step parent to you know to file for you. So um, right. So th- these are ways. You know there are ways that you can bring um, you know attention. And you have to know your stuff. You have to know your stuff. I was up in a, a case up in Buffalo before Judge Hochul, and. She, uh, my client is in deportation. I couldn't physically be there, so I was appearing telephonically several years ago. And so the judge said to me, "I am." She said, "What form of relief are you seeking? Is your client seeking?" And I said, "Adjustment of status under Section 245I." And she said, "But wasn't that? Didn't your client already make such, a, such an application before CIS, and that was denied?" I said, "No, she made my client made an application under 245A." We are proceeding on the 245i. We are seeking to proceed on the 245i. And the trial attorney says, oh, well, I don't see anything here that says, um, that, that show that your, your client, you know, is entitled to proceed on the 245i. I said, well, if you read my papers, you would see she's claiming, the, you know, um, she was a derivative beneficiary on the earlier filed petition. Right, which her grand grandmother had filed in behalf of her father, and then she was a derivative under that. So she then said to me, the trial attorney then said to me, the government attorney that is, well, I need to see that petition and I need to see her name listed on that petition to show that she was a derivative under that petition, that prior petition. I said, her name doesn't have to be listed on the petition, whether it's listed or not is irrelevant. There, that's, there's no such requirement under the law. So the judge, uh, the judge says, counsel, can you elaborate? And I elaborated. And then she said, counsel, can you brief it for us? How much time would you need to brief that issue? I said, give me six weeks, judge. But I know I could have briefed it in less than in six weeks. I could have briefed it in two days. Because I know that stuff right off the top of my head. But I needed, you know, you always give yourself more time. It's not one case you have. You have a, a plethora of cases. So um, I, briefed it. I briefed it. I was given a certain date, deadline by which to submit my brief. And then the government attorney was given, an, you know, another um, a date by which to respond, to put in her reply brief, the government reply brief. Well, the government never put in a reply brief because I was right. And, um, you know, my, my client, uh, when when my client left the courtroom that day, though, right after that hearing, young people, you know, some like the 23, 24 year old husband and wife, and they were there with their parents. And I remember the, the young lady, her, her father called me. When he got out of the courtroom and he said to me, Miss Blake, he said, tell me your fee, anything, anything. He said, the courtroom was spellbound when you were speaking. Mm-hmm. The judge, everyone was listening attentively when you were speaking and the government attorney. And a lot of people learn a lot of things that day. So you can't always assume, you know, that the government attorney has it right or that even the judge has it right. You have to fight with them sometimes. To, you know to press your position and as long as you have the statute and the law you understand and even when the law is against you you have to make arguments say well here is right so the law says this however i do not believe that the facts of my client's case amounts to, to this mm. so you have to find ways to distinguish your client's case from a case that is negative that does not favor your client so these are the types of things that lawyers are called upon to do all the time Right. So once again, as I said, there's no bright line rule necessarily. You just have to be clever and you have to make creative arguments. Mm -hmm. And they know the trial of facts, which would be like the judge, they will sit down and they will take into, you know, under consideration. Right. You know, your argument, the logic, you know, precedent decisions in that circuit, um, the legislative intent of the statute in terms of deciding which side is, you know, which side he's going to, to go with. So that is how decisions are made. And once again, as I said, lay people don't understand that. A case can turn on the smallest thing, on the smallest little thing. We had a, um, we had a case again where 
a client, um, we had done a motion to reopen. This client had been ordered deported from the U.S. about like 15, 16, 17 years before they came to me. And they, you know, now she was married to a U.S. citizen who had filed for her, had an I-130, a petition approved, but they couldn't go forward because she had a final order of deportation against her. So they retained me at that point, and I did a motion to reopen to the court. The court denied my motion. I did a, I, I appealed it to the BIA, the Board of Immigration Appeals. The BIA knocked on my motion and denied it. The client said, what shall I do now, Miss Blake? I said, there's nothing to be done. Just, just sit. Then about two years ago, in 2019, uh, three years ago, whatever, a case came down called Liz Chavez, came down from the United States. And I said, you know, it had nothing to do with the issue in my client's case. But some of the argument and the logic that it used in arriving at its decision, I thought it could be helpful to my client's case. And I used that. That is the argument I used. That was, you know, and said, the, the logic that was used in this Chavez applies to the facts of my client's case. And I, so I made another motion to reopen. And lo and behold, it was granted. Right? So do one is home free and clear now. Wow. So as I said, you have to be you have to be diligent, you have to be astute, you have to stay abreast of the law because immigration law, very vibrant, it's always changing. It's always, always changing. And you know, so those are some of the war stories that I've had over the years. I have a very, very good track record. As I said, I have a cult following, especially I have young, you know, young black men, 15, 16, 17 convictions, get him citizenship, get citizenship for the man. The man, this day, the man called me all the while, Mummy Blake, you need anything, Mummy Blake, this, yeah. Because I have been, um, as I said, I've been very, very, I've been very successful in my cases. And that is why I have been in business for so long and my reputation is what it is. So I am I'm very proud to report that. And you know Rastafari. So there. Right. I have to yes, I have to myself in my in my business because uh, because it is so. I have a long list of clients. I could bring you hundreds of clients who sing my praises. You understand? Who are very, very, very protective of me and you know, just very, very proud of me too. Very proud of me for what I have done. I've helped a lot of people in, in the Caribbean community. You know, yeah, you know, Guyana, lot of Guyanese clients, Surinamese, I even have Bangladeshi Indian clients. Wow. And um, yeah, from all, all over, from all over. And um, as I said, we have done a very good job and we, we couldn't be in business and be as successful as we are if we were not doing the right thing, if we were not, you understand me? If we were not getting the desired results. And so I, I want to, uh, right, I wanted to sort of lay out um, you know, what it is that we do, what it is that we can do. And that is why I sample letters to show you the type of so complicated and complicated immigration law. Very complex, you know, issue by issue by issue by issue. And, but um, let me just segue into this also, my love. If you, if you need to ask me a question, please feel free. Yes, I. You know, yes, please feel free, my lord. All right. At any point. Yeah. Um. How much? How much of what the eye is doing is is um is connected towards you know slavery in a sense. Then you know being being in America. Um. In in eighteen seventy, you know. The right was given to 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 African Americans, you know, to be citizens um, within within that time in in mm -hmm. America, you know what I mean? And we know why, you know, we know the the, the, the whole story behind that still. But um, how much of what the eye is doing? Because me or the eye mentioned, you know, Surinamese and you know most 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 of the places. Is is where black people, Guyana and and, and Jamaica and, and so on, mm -hmm. which you know they are you know African people that is you know trying to find a a, 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 a you know a freedom in America, you know trying to have freedom of movement then, you know able to travel and you know work and you know what I mean. Yes. Um, 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 all right. 
Yeah, how much of what the eye is doing is 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 you know is aimed around around that aspect. Well, here here is what America offers to the world, and, and that is the image that it projects, right? That is its richest country on the you know in the world, and that it offers opportunities that people can't get anywhere else. No, you are correct that the large a large percentage of my clients black people, but I have a equal Indians. Indians are sometimes I have more Indian clients than black clients. But there's a lot of Indians in, 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 in Guyana, a lot of Indians in Trinidad, a lot of Indians in Suriname. So um, I have a large um, percentage, and as I said, I have Bangladeshi clients. You know, clients from India, um, proper. But here's the thing: so America, it um, you know, advertises itself around the world as being the richest country, and offering. Um, you know the greatest opportunities and especially for you know upward mobility right and um and so every, a lot of people <laughs> want to um they want a piece of that right and y- let me tell you if you know how many people millions of people apply each year to go to the united states either as tourists or you know for permanent residency so clearly there is something here that is, is drawing them. And uh, let me give you an, an example. And that is what I want to appeal to my to my community, the Rastafari community. We know the system is evil. We know the system is wicked. But you must find ways to you to utilize the system for your benefit. A green card in America has value. It has value. And let me tell you why it has value. If you don't know it has value, other other communities other races other ethnicities have utilized the immigration laws for their benefit we need to do the same for example the h2b the, i'm sorry the h1b visa heavily heavily utilized by the indians from india because they come here on that visa and they get into the tech industry if you look at the tech industry silicon valley in california it is i'm telling you huge percentage of Indians. It is almost probably about 80% Indians that work in the tech industry because the Indians, they utilize the H-1B visa and get into that industry. All right? Number two, you have the Chinese. There is a visa called the EB-5 investor visa where in order to qualify for that visa, you have to invest a minimum of half a million US dollars in a business, either a new business or, you know, ongoing business, um, invest at minimum of half a million in order to qualify for that visa, the EB-5. Well, let me tell you, the Chinese monopolize the EB-5 visa, right? Just to get a green card. So if a person is willing to invest half a million, a million, two million to get a green card, that means that, that person is already rich enough. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, because they have a million to invest. Because the minimum you can invest is half a million. And then there's cost on top of that. Right? All the other costs associated. You have to pay a lawyer's fee. You have to pay all kinds of fees. You understand? If you are willing to invest a million dollars to get a green card, then you must have wait. If you're on the outside looking in, you're saying, but wait, why are these rich Chinese investing a million, two million dollars to get a green card in America? The green card must have a value because they know when they come to America that one million, that two million is going to turn into ten million. Mm-hmm. That this is a land of opportunity, and so if they want to grow their fortune, they need to be here and have legal status. They monopolize it. You have some Nigerians too who take advantage of the um the EB five and even some Indians and whatever. But it is almost I am telling you eighty five percent Chinese with that EB-5 visa, right? Investor visa. So, you know, the green card has a value. In addition to that, you know, we've always heard stories over the years, right? That the Mexicans, they line up on the border because as you know, Mexico shares a land border with the US. So Mexicans are always traversing the um, the border to come into the United States. And some a lot of times pregnant Mexican women, they wait until they're almost you know, ready to deliver maybe eight months or so and then they cross the border so that they ch- their children can be born in the United States, right? 
and that has been the rumor for years and it is and it is not just rumor because it's borne out by the you know by statistics um but because they they too recognize the benefit of having a child being born in the united states and having u.s citizenship mm. u.s citizenship has value if the green card has value u.s citizenship has 10 times the, the value of a green card so they are willing to do that but the chinese it is the chinese who took that to a different level you understand me the chinese have something they call birth tourism whereby they they bring in large groups of pregnant chinese women into the united states on visitor visa when these women are about seven eight months pregnant and they the women stay here in the u.s and they give birth then they return to china a few months later when the child is maybe about three four months old they return to china with the kid the child is raised and educated in chinese culture when the child turns 18 the parents dispatch the child back into the u.s as a u.s citizen because the child is a u.s citizen. Mm -hmm. so they get to go to college you know and as u.s citizens they qualify for all sorts of grants and loans and scholarships so they dispatch them so that is a plan these people they work strategically they use the laws they utilize and capitalize on the laws for their benefit and for the benefit of their community and i don't see why we can't do the same thing once again we know that the system is wicked we know all of everything that is wrong with the system but we must utilize the system for our benefit and we have not we're not good at doing that and I'm not advocating for people to break the law, US immigration law, but I'm saying, why not utilize it for our benefit? Mm -hmm. We need to start forging relationships. We in the West start forging relationships with those on the continent, right? The indigenous brothers and sisters. Maybe we can start, you know, yeah, forging relationships, as I say. When we travel abroad, when we go abroad and we have children born, especially I'm talking to the man, them now. A lot of them leave families behind here in the West. They go to, let's say Ghana, that's the, that's the country I have the most familiarity with, and they start having children there. But because they left the United States in such a state, they left their kids behind, broken relationships, broken children, right? Mm -hmm. They have abandoned the children more or less. They go and they start new families, and there's no connection between that those children and the children that the, the brethren had in the West. No, that is foolishness. What you should be doing, you should maintain proper relationships with your children born in the West so that they, their siblings, they can benefit. The siblings who were born on the continent can benefit from the connection, right? They can benefit because a lot of times, a lot of these brethren who repatriate, they're not US citizens. They may be green card holders. And after a while, if you stay out of the country long enough, you will lose your green card status and you can't come back and it's of no benefit to your children and here's what i'm saying once again we know the wickedness of the system we know the wickedness of the west but we also know that there are benefits that can be gotten there's benefits to be had so why have children born in in ghana let's say and then you restrict them right they can't travel they can't further them education abroad because you have not you have not secured them citizenship for them. Now, if you are a U.S. citizen and you travel to Ghana and you have a child, that child is a U.S. citizen, provided you register the child before the child is 18 and apply for birth abroad to a U.S. citizen. Then that child is automatic gets automatic citizenship, right? But I am saying a lot of the brethren they're not doing that, or they're not even U.S. citizens. They are simply um, green card holders, and they cannot transmit any benefit to the child on account of being a green card holder. So they have those children in Africa. Those children are, can't travel. Why would you want to restrict and blunt your child's chances? Your kids must have all of the passports that they can have. They must have access to the UK, the US, to, to travel all over the world. We are trying to, we want, we want to have more children, but also children who are educated, children who are exposed children who are sophisticated, children who can navigate the world. You want to have children and just have them in one little country and you're struggling and can't even feed them? 
all kind of stuff you can't send them to school so instead of you now being a help instead of you being an asset to the to your race to your community you have to become dependent so you may have to be calling people in the west send you send me a hundred dollars send me fifty dollars send me you know send, send me a hundred pounds you understand true when it doesn't have to be this way mm-hmm. you need to give your children the widest opportunity his majesty sent out ethiopians to go study abroad because he knew the benefit of that kwame and kuma studied in the united states and so many other african leaders because what we knew that africa is rich we knew it is mineral rich richest continent in the world but it has not been harnessed for the benefit of africans and so you find that even in mineral rich countries people are starving they are they are living on two dollars a day or less sometimes you understand so yeah. why would you want to bring your child and, and and constrict them confine them to that make it children make it so that even if they're, they are raised in ghana or whichever country you are not maybe uh, south africa ethiopia let them have access to the waste so that they can go to school they can further their education let them have u.s citizenship let them have jamaican citizenship let them have citizenship for as many places that they can so that they can travel they can expand their horizon so we are not thinking strategically we are thinking we are too emotional we are too emotional and we need to get away from that other races other people are utilizing the laws for their benefits and we need to do the same without emotion without emotion right because we don't know just want a whole lot of children you know we want a whole lot of intelligent educated children children who are confident children who can travel so what does a child do when your culture does not provide you with the tools that you need to navigate the world what does a child do and we wonder why we can't hold on to our young people the young people are leaving rastafari in droves them leaving bobo shanti in droves because the culture offers them nothing they're not signing up for poverty they don't want to sign up for poverty and deprivation mm-hmm. and all these limits these restrictions that don't get us anywhere it just keeps us in poverty and i'm not saying we're not we're not to have principle we have our principle but we can work within those principles i know daughters when they were going to nursing school down in florida they had to hide baba shanti daughters because fire born when i was going to law school man used to call my husband and say what lawyer this eh so you can't have a culture that is anti education mm. that is not progressive that's no, not going to get us anywhere yeah no. we, we have to change that mindset man we that need more lawyers must be changed hmm? M- more doctors more lawyers yes you know and then when we, listen to me and another thing that we do we penalize successful people in our midst mm-hmm. look at the fight that um priest kailish gets this man is a devoted husband and father the man has nice children beautiful wife the man is a man of he's upright principled he's a successful businessman and they want to tear him down mm-hmm. why Oh, I'm arrogant. Oh, I'm arrogant. This is bossy. Really? Because I'll take it. If that's all the fault him have, if arrogance and bossiness is all the fault him have. Huh? Arrogant and bossy. I don't see that in other priests still, but... Uh, but, wait, but listen, <laughs> but even if him did arrogant and bossy, so what? He has accomplished something. He, can, he can afford to be arrogant and bossy. So what? That was all the sin you know, sin. I wish all of us was arrogant and bossy. That was our only thing. You understand? Mm-hmm. Another a priest like a, look at priest Nappy, another successful man, right? You have priest um priest Desmond. Look at priest Desmond. Probably the most accomplished Rasta man. Eh? He works now for the National Institute of Health. Right? He used to be with the Mayo Clinic. The man is our um. Uh, but uh, oncologist doctor 
something to that effect. I saw him recently, earlier this year in Ghana. He came to Ghana while I was there, and we got together. My husband and I, and my father was there, and we went down to his hotel and we met with him and his wife and children. His mother was there, two other people. Then I had to leave, and then you know. Yeah, I flew out and he was still there and then he went up to the house and my husband fetched him and his mother and his friends and everybody's children, his wife. And, you know, he said to me, he said, I, Empress Marina, he said, I've always loved you. He said, but I love you even more now that I know, you know, several members of your family. And he says, because it is so hard to find, we didn't have to, you know, other Boba Man, to find people, family, that we just see him find those. You understand? Mm -hmm. education the importance of education no here's a black man a priest a bobo shanty priest a rasta man a bobo shanty priest who's pulling up and what i'm saying is probably arguably the most successful rasta man across any mansion mm -hmm. across any mansion in better fights arrogant and bossy again arrogant and bossy so what? So what? I wish that we're all the same in the world. Arrogant and bossy. The man that do our work. You know that? The, the man that listen to me. The man is in a position can help black people. Mm -hmm. You know, we are unimaginable. He was telling me the other day, he's been invited me to come down to Washington, D.C. Down to Maryland where him and his family live. To come and visit. You know, his mother is down there, his wife, him children, him, so forth and so on. And he's been inviting me to come down. Because... He, he can he and i can talk and there's no there's no bad mind no grudgefulness no envy no trying to put him down or undermine him or call him sell out and all these kind of things mm. i don't know listen remember the, 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 the bible story you know joseph how joseph was able to help him in brethren then because of the position he held in egypt during the time of the family right so how come we can't apply that to contemporary situation? Why why Chris Bittman has to be a sellout? Eh? We punish the successful people in our midst. We punish them. And it, it's all because of their identity. Instead of we praise them and appreciate the position that they hold and what they can do for the culture and for the black race in general. But no, we don't reward that. Yeah, so and then we wonder why we can't get when we wonder why we can't get in the way. I saw an article the other day when they were saying that how many Rastafari elders, the poor, broke, and almost neglected. Because we don't have any money to take care of our elders. We don't have any money to take care of our elders. And we're not even trying to do anything for them. We talk all the time, my lord, about how much the white man owes us. And we know the white man owes us. We know we're due. Reparations. But what about what we owe ourselves? What about what we owe ourselves? We don't owe it to ourselves to take care of our family, our children, our spouses, our neighbor, our sister, our brother. How many, how many bobo shots do you think in North America? In the United States? Hmm? You don't think we could have put $10 a month? You don't think everybody could have put $10 a month? Mm -hmm. eh? Let us say there are 500 bobos. Let us a very conservative number. Let's say five hundred, and you put ten dollars a month. Eh? Everybody put ten dollars a month. We can do what we can do. We can take care of one another. True. When the elderly people them get sick and need to go, when people can't send them kids go school, somebody can. We, we can do so much. We can buy land, big farm land in a village, wherever, Ghana, wherever we are. Hmm? We can do so much. If we could just get away from being so bad mind, so grudgeful, so covetous, mm -hmm. so vindictive, so filled with hate, it is destroying us. Mm -hmm. It is destroying us. How we need to take. We need to take heed. We really need to take heed. The voices, because what you know? we have been doing, doing more of what doesn't work, doesn't work. Doing more of what doesn't work, doesn't work. Doesn't work at all. We, we have to change. We must change. We can't progress. 
We keep doing the same thing. See, year after year after year. The Congress is nowhere. The Congress is nowhere. As my husband said, the Congress is going to be the biggest brew manufacturer in Jamaica. When him first, when we first got the foundation, I think he was saying, oh, we, we can't do purchase order, and we're going to invoice, and stuff on, and so on, so on, so on. Man, start looking at them and say, yeah, I'm come with them, them come with them colonialism. Mm -mm. Them come with them colonialism. When we were starting up an internet cafe in Ghana in 2012, two different brethren said to me, you ever hear, um, you ever hear his majesty say anything about um, um, internet cafe yet? You ever hear your daughter say anything about internet cafe? Oh, you're going to start up internet cafe. I said, what? So if Dada never say internet cafe by name, Dada didn't know anything when name internet cafe, I don't know nothing about that. Then so couldn't tell, tell me to mm. start up or don't start up internet cafe. I mean, this is the level of illiteracy that is among us. May I tell her? And this is what is keeping us back. We're not um, innovative, but we believe that the culture, you, no culture, you can't militate against economic um, progress. No culture can survive that way. You militate, you, you do not elevate certain type of things. People who we should be holding up as in sample for, the, for other people, we lick them down and say them too bossy and show off. Mm -mm. <laughs> that is counterintuitive. That is counter, I, I don't understand. I don't understand. And it is these people who ride in time after time, they give a financial strength when it is needed. The people them fight the most. It is sad. I can tell you one thing with the bingy house. They do not, um, they don't frown upon education. In fact, they embrace it. They embrace education. But we, we fight down education. Yeah, that is... um. Yeah, that is a stumbling block. <laughs> Seriously. Yes, big yeah, time. Because um yeah, you know, even if that I never even talk about um internet, you know, Marcus Garvey told us about we have to be, you know, extra lance in science and technology. So um having an internet calf would be providing um a level of 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 technology then, you know what I mean? You know, in in, in, in our space in a in a yeah. place like Ghana, so you know, some sometimes my lord, it is yeah, sometimes people know exactly what they're doing, you know. It, it is um a deliberate deterrent, you know, for try and stop you do something progressive, you know. So sometimes them think that deliberate people are not even say boy, they're not even educated car <laughs> you know. But so it go with our people still. Yes, very small minded. Yeah, very, very small minded. Yeah, true. And man. um, it's 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 quite sad. It's quite sad. We need we need strong leadership. We need the the, the Congress needs strong leadership. It needs, a, you know, people of integrity. People with vision. You understand? Mm -hmm. Because a blind man can't lead anybody. Right? Because he, he himself lost. He, the, the mark of a great leader is to is to create other leaders. True. Not necessarily more followers, you know. You inspire, you educate, you lead people, you help them to work together to solve common problems. Even when you, even your enemies or your perceived enemies. Eh? Mm -hmm. You create a team of rivals, people working together. You have people who are talking about wanting to be leader, right? They want to be leaders, but them, them, they're very partisan. This group, I don't want, I have a calling group on Sundays, and I don't want this one on it, don't, this one don't do it. You can't be a leader. You're not qualified. If that is your approach, then clearly you know nothing about leadership. The more a person disagrees with you, the more you, must, you need to have them in your circle. It's because you need to hear their side. You need to hear their perspective. True. And iron out the kinks. Because they're going to raise issues and questions on things that you may be blind to mm -hmm. because you're so invested in a particular position. You are so invested in a particular program or whatever you're implementing, you're seeking to implement. And somebody can, can come in with fresh eyes and say, but 
how is this going to work? So and so and so are rich and ask you some questions. And because you don't want to be asked any questions, you don't want to see the flaws that may exist in your plan. So you try to keep these people out. And you eh? and you sit down and you chat people and you talk all kind of things about people in, in, a, in a, these meetings that are supposed to be about advancement of the Congress. Eh? And sometimes I tell you the people who are doing the talking, have con- they have committed some of the worst transgressions. Mm. And then they have the temerity. They have the temerity. The gall to come out and talk about other people. Eh? You want to speck out of somebody's eye and while the beam in your eye. Hmm? You're convicted of all kind of crimes that we know say. A baby born last week knows say you can't touch your baby. And arrest a man, arrest a woman. Eh? And you are a priest, King Emmanuel. And you touch cocaine and you want to talk about other people. You better hold your car now. I'm glad to forgive you and welcome you back into the fold. You understand? Rasta. Yeah. Yeah. That is some serious you thing should. here. Yeah. You better wheel and come again. Because mm-hmm. you ain't got no standing to talk about anybody. Mm-hmm. You must come, you know, with your head bow. And ask us to take you back. You understand? For real. Yeah, you can't serve in an opposition of eh? And then you, you don't have what it takes. Separate and apart from that, you can say, all right, everyone makes mistakes. But separate and apart from you, your character is not good. Mm. You do not have the temperament to lead. You more want to sit down and, and, and size and dice up people. You want to talk to my husband and a black man and all that kind of something there. Eh, well, I'm going to tell you one thing, he never, he never touched cocaine yet. I'm going to tell you that. And he never would. He never would. Listen, I remember people in our 20s. And things were very hard on us. At that time, we had, um, at that time we had three children. And we were really going through a rough time. And a brethren come to my husband and ask him to deliver. It wasn't a rasta man, it was a ballet man to deliver a cocaine package from one place to the next. And my husband said, he came home and I'm saying to me, Marina, you know, so and so and so and so. And, so. and I said, absolutely not. I said, if you do that, I will pack up the children and leave. And um, he said, and if you do that, he said, God will kill you. Because you know better. I would rather we starve. But we not, you not do that. You understand? Mm-hmm. And we are young people and and, des- and destitute. But you have to have character. You have to hold to your principles. Mm-hmm. All when them difficult. All when them pain. All when it is painful. You have to hold to your principles. And my husband didn't do it. No, I'm saying, no, I can't do it, Marina. You're so right. I can't do it. And then the class that the man who told him to carry something, he was he was killed. He was murdered in one of them kind of transactions there. Mm-mm. You understand? We said, God will kill you because they know, say so you know better. We know better. We can't put our hands to certain things. For real. And we were young people, as I said, and, and in a, some serious financial difficulties. But our integrity and our principles. Yeah, man, come first. So, You'd have to stand up for something, you know. You couldn't. Uh, you have to stand up. For, yeah, you have to stand up for something. Yeah. You have to stand up for something. Yeah, that. that. You understand? So, uh, my lord. Yeah, yeah. May yeah. I tell you, we are in a bad way. Yeah, man. We are in a bad way. Um, you know, uh, one last thing. I don't know. Once again, if you have any questions for me. Um, um well you know they i say we're in a bad way and um when when all right you, 
we see the state and the con and the condition uh the congress and thing seeing and um i know one 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 issue that um stand out because even my virgin called me the other day saying that um uh, i just uh you know me i come from up our artist yard and some youth see me and you know they must say boy you did a talk about white bubble you know the in in you know the congress and thing and yes and you know the, the 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 way the virgin did sound you know it, it just just put me off you know it just it just put me off because it it, it was a virgin from um from canada and you know him same him same is a bubble you know what i mean so yeah you know he 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 did a try get a reaction from i based upon what him hear you know mm-hmm. That priest Hannibal, I think it was priest Iron Priest Hannibal was was on the, the, the program, you know. Yes. So, you know, so I I was saying, no, what what is their perspective, and you know, uh, other other are Europeans then in the Congress. Okay, all right. I also I listened. Um, I heard um, Priest Annabelle. By the way, I didn't even know that he had gotten priesthood. Mm. So you know, shout out to Priest Annabelle. Um, but I had also listened in on a program where you had um, Priest Adigon, mm-hmm. and you know he gave a, a, a I mean a, a wonderful. Let me tell you, man, it's like a history lesson. You know, expressed himself well and made some you know very cogent points and things like that anyway in he had mentioned something about white priests white people in the congress and then a, a brethren another brethren i don't remember his name had made some comments to say how is having white people in the congress how is that how is that black supremacy mm. right mm-hmm. well i agree with the brethren i mean i know that um priest adigon was not happy he's saying that the brethren is cherry picking and you know sort of stuck on that issue well it is sufficiently big it's a huge issue and it needs to be addressed Mm -hmm. and um i don't yeah i I, you know and and so listen to me now rastafari is a black liberation struggle black people okay and dada king emmanuel charles edwards he was not He was not muted in his intent. You see when he named the Congress? It, three different times he said black. In case, it, in case, it knows, it, it, you know, we're slow mm-hmm. and we can't pick up. The man said the Ethiopia, Africa, black international Congress. Huh? You want anything plainer than that? He never said mixed multitude. He never said rainbow coalition. He could have said any of those things. Instead, the Ethiopia, Africa, Black International Congress. So, in case on a slow and stupid and can't get it, I must say it three times. You understand? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that we can't, yeah, we can't, we can't hear him loud and clear. Yeah. <laughs> so him not bending and talk. Yeah, our Jamaican people them not talk with water and mouth. Mm-hmm. He might tell you, he might declare to you openly what him, what he's about. Natural. So yeah. So we must we must adhere to that. No, you. There are people who are going to say, oh, but um, whatever I'm name is. Well, I do not know what was in, um in Dada's mind, but if uh, listen to me now, we we have to use common sense. If I know you as a Sabbath keeper, my Lord, let us say I know you as a strict Sabbath keeper. Like, let us, yeah, you understand? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I don't know if you're a strict Sabbath keeper. I know, you know, Priest Kylie is a strict Sabbath keeper. If I know Priest Kylie is a strict um, Sabbath keeper, and in all the years I've been keeping strict Sabbath strictly, and then one Sabbath I see him outside doing something, how can I conclude from that one incident? Oh, Chris Kylie should no longer he's no longer keeping Sabbath. He has um repudiated Sabbath keeping. 
that's not a reasonable inference. That's not, that, that's not a reasonable conclusion from that one um that one incident. Mm. So in all of that is years of of running the Ethiopia Africa Black International Congress. If him do if he one time him him him, him, um, him prone a white man, that is an aberration. That doesn't become the rule. That's an exception. The exception can't swallow the rule. Mm. The exception can't trump the rule. So I do not know what's going on at that time. Maybe there's something specific that needed to be done. And True. this is the only way it could have gotten done. Every other race, ethnicity, them have them, them have them group. They have the, they, them have organizations for themselves and themselves alone. And they make no apology for it. Why is it? Why is Rastafari running away from its roots? Why is Rastafari running away from its roots? It's a black supremacy culture, black a black culture, especially Baba Shanti. What are we doing? Have we completely lost our minds? We must have lost our minds. I don't know what it is. I don't know what we are looking for. We are big friends. Eh? How? No, you people talk about oh, peace and peace and love, peace and love, and um, you say a, 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 a remnant from every nation. The Bible says a remnant from every nation. Well, one of the things to learn about the Bible is that we must take the good from it and discard the bad. Mm-hmm. How do you differentiate between the good and the bad? You, a person, may ask. How do you differentiate between the good and the bad? Well, let me help you. You differentiate between the good and the bad. Whatever advances your interest is the good. And whatever militates against your interest, that's the bad. So you see the remnant from every nation? That's the bad. Discard that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay? We are a black, a black culture. We are a black supremacy culture. I'm in agreement with Chris Hannibal on that. You understand me? This is black man something. Black man and black woman. Which no white right. man can't hold no spring to the no no Mm-mm. years ago i wrote a letter and i said i made a statement that we must we need to expel every white man from the congress and uh the Cong- and the, the headquarters in jamaica sent me a letter i sent i sent you a copy of it to you i think i believe yeah you know yeah. my yeah. and telling me instructing me to issue uh, an apology well i issued a backhanded apology because i said that um if my words you know, may have offended or hurt anyone. That I apologize for, but my sentiment remains the same. Expel white man from the culture, from the from the Congress. Them not belong here. No, some people may say, oh, um, a peace and love. Well, do you with peace and love? Well, peace and love, right? Equal rights and justice for all. That is our ultimate goal. I agree, right? That is our long-term goal. Our short-term goal is to redeem black people, mm-hmm. right? And to heal black people in the minds. You cannot put your long-term goal ahead of your short-term goal. You must achieve your short-term goal first, and then you can pursue your long-term goal. So now is not the time. Even if, even if down the line, we were supposed to be um, yeah, uniting. Not, now is not the time. We need to heal black people first. Parson christen them picnic first. And we have a christen our one first. Black man first. Black man and black woman first. Mm-hmm. You understand me? And if anything leave over, white man can get it. But black man and black woman first. Oh. No apology for that. Oh. I will never apologize for that. How, 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 how would you react to ones out there now who probably would deem what you're saying as um, discriminative? Dimis- dis- dis- dismissive? Dismissive and dis- okay, discriminatory? Yeah. Okay, so what? And, 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 yeah. um, uh, and would, would want to like um, quote his, his, his majesty's speech in... in, in I wrote in, something in, on that too. I wrote, a, I wrote an article on that many years ago. I don't believe I sent that one to you. And I am saying, once again, you must look in context. 
You must, his majesty was a statesman. Mm-hmm. He has to do what he needs to do in that capacity. Marcus Garvey was not a statesman. So he never have to appease the heads of state around the world. He can talk him truth, plain and straight. You understand? You Once again, you have to look at things in context. In the overall context of things. I wrote an article on it. I'm going to share it with you. No, you can't. You can't twist up His Majesty's words. Mm. Just like how white people now try to twist up um, Dr. Martin Luther King's words for their own benefit. Them twist up His Majesty's words to, to support them folly. So all them are come go on like say, all the lot of brethren are profess consciousness, black consciousness. They are still in awe of whiteness. Let me tell you that. Them all sleep white. And, you and- understand? And the speech, them sleep white. The speech, the speech itself had um, nothing in the sense to say, "Boy, um, yes, Europeans, you know, is is one lover. Uh, you know, His Majesty deliberately said that you know we Africans will fight. You know, if, if 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 necessary, he didn't say we the rest of the world or we um everybody. Mm-hmm. He said we Africans will fight yes. if necessary, cause we are confident in the victory of good over evil. So um that speech didn't direct to um to Africans in in no shape or form, it was a speech directed towards European oppression in in absolutely um in Africa absolutely. and against against African people. You know, it wasn't in aid of Europeans in in no shape. You know, because when His Majesty telling that they should you should have tolerance and goodwill and understanding. You know. He wasn't speaking to to Africans. He was addressing the right. League of Nations. So you know, when people quote is that particular speech and try to in support of them folly. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. You understand? They're they're disingenuous. Yeah, and they don't even understand what they're doing. I think they do. I think they, they it understand. Is a, it is a dangerous. No, it is a dangerous and suicidal position to have. It is a dangerous position to adopt to have white people in a something and I, I you know in a leading free position reports had come back to us that um some of the white ones in mean, that chile or brazil or wherever were were abusing the dark skin one and the black people them have them I wash their clothes and I clean them shoes and you, you understand me wow. because that is the white man's natural nature you know it is not that you know my lord we must not be fooled you see people who make those decisions as to having white people in the congress they do so either out of ignorance or out of economic necessity mm. then we sell out the congress you can't send a hungry man go represent you you understand Seriously. because we sell out something for little or nothing mm. you can't get a crack addict your tv if you go sell because your tv value a thousand dollars and we sell it for 200 to buy him next him next arm um, hit of crack you understand yeah man you can't send hungry people for to be your emissary to be your ambassador to be your representative because they ain't got no money so they might look something from the white man white boy of philadelphia they pan alter see eh? me sitting at the congregation i said no you know yeah you understand me this can't work oh let me check their lead increase the service oh you know so and so and so you know i would know the more god the more god you know certain things you know you can't go you can't go africa and you can't do it in a black woman with game tell him already me tell him already what the rules are well the man did exactly that the man got gone and got married to a black woman Mm-mm. the man can't he, he did whatever he wants to do you can't stop him you understand me he tricked you and that's what they do moreover from a psychological standpoint, let me tell you why it is so harmful. Studies have shown, right, that when girls are educated at all girls' school, 
they perform better in math, science, and technology generally. However, when these same girls are put in a coed situation where boys and girls are learning together, the, the girls almost always lose their confidence and they resort to softer subjects such as English, social studies, history, exactly. They unconsciously yield to the natural order, when I say natural order, quote unquote, the hierarchy that society has set up. They naturally yield to the to that hierarchy, the natural order, where boys pursue certain su subjects and girls pursue certain other subjects. Mm. So when you so you, you undercut them their confidence when you mix them with boy with boys and girls when they are in their own when they are by themselves they perform better. better okay. This is exactly what happens when you bring white people among us and put them in position of power over us. The very thing that we are trying to eliminate from our children's minds, our children, and our grandchildren. We want to erase that from their mind as what you know of white people being on top, white people being prettier, white people being smarter, more intelligent, more accomplished. That is what we want to eradicate. Mm -hmm. No. And yet still our come are we we are actually <laughs> we are actually reaffirming the very thing that we are we are supposed to be um we, we are supposed to be looking out against. We're, that's what we're doing in our children's mind. You know, they must be white man. And this and that. And white people, this is what they do. Them can't behave. They have no behavior. Them come in, them take over everything and roll it. Roll it up before you know it. You, you are beg them. If, 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 listen, in years to come, you when you say them start Rastafari. Mm -hmm. Them are going to be the majority. They're going to take it over. And you're going to say it's for them thing. You understand? Mm -hmm. True. <laughs> I'm going to listen to me. We know who they are, so we don't have to spell and guess and guess and spell. I wonder if they're going to try to sink the ship. For that is who they are. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. Right? I'm going to tell you a little quote that my, my aunt used to say. I hear, she hear her say it all the time. She said, Well, you can't see a deer. No, wait till night for look for it. Hmm. We know who they are already. So we don't have to wait and say, let me see what you can work with when they reach Africa and move up here. Because mm -hmm. the Bridget, you know, when I approached the priest and I said to him, I don't understand what is going on here. Oh, yeah, me give him the orders and this and that. And, you know, we're going to carry them home with us you now. We're going to carry them home with us. And then we're going to try and enslave us again. And that's when his majesty will come up on him white charger, you know, and slew them. Mm -mm. I said, what? I said, what? <laughs> then if you know, mm -hmm. if you meet a man on the road, um, Prophet, I just start and he tell him, I will rob you when you, when you, when you, when you carry him home. Oh, eh? mm -mm. You're going to carry Prevention is better than cure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. An ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. So guess what? I'm not taking you home with me because you're going to rob me. Mm -hmm. You're going to try to enslave me. Mm -hmm. So if you know that already, eh? why not avert the crisis? Mm. So what that you're makes reading, no sense. It's illogical. Yeah, what you're reading not making sense to you. You're not making sense of it. It's <laughs> counterintuitive. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Mm -mm. I don't understand. But nothing more than him and the man are also together. You understand me? So when he twists up himself like a pretzel to find justification for his action. Yeah. Once again, it's an economic thing. It's mm -hmm. a personal economic thing. And so... When people are compromising that way, that's why those people can't be leaders. So like a sell out, sell out the thing. thing. Mm -hmm. They will sell out the thing. Mm -hmm. They will sell out the thing. Them petty to and them small minded. Them lack vision. Them lack intelligence. They cannot hold the position that they are going after. You understand? They are unqualified for it. It's a serious thing. It's a yeah. serious thing. Very, very yeah. serious. It's going to it is going to top loss this white mm -hmm. white rasta. It is going to top loss. We are going to become you see a white people going to Africa and take over. Mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. That is their nature. That is, it is what they do. We are foolish if we don't recognize that and respond to it accordingly. We are extremely foolish. And so, once again, I agree. 
with um, Priest Annibal. And I also agree with the Brethren who asked the question of Ras Adigon. He, he, the man asked a, a, a pointed question. Macaque how does that it. comport with... Yes. How does that comport? How does having white people in Boba Shanti comport with black supremacy? Mm-hmm. Explain it to you because the man is confused. He's perplexed. Mm-hmm. Because and he... He, was, he, was, he was perfectly right to ask that question. Mm-hmm. He's within his right. He's absolutely right. I think I think we have gone on for quite some time. True. <laughs> yes, my lord. So perhaps yeah. we can um But um just before the I go still, go um ahead. you know the, the the you speak about what you do and thing as a as a lawyer, but how how long did that process um take for you to reach you know the level in terms of training and, and, and the schooling part? Well, what? It's what? Seven years of schooling, right? Formal schooling. And then, you know, I've been practicing now for over 20 years. So, um, yeah, this is where I am. This is where I am now. And do you have to do like... You know, I'm into, mm-hmm. Do you have to do like, um, like after a five-year period, you have to sharpen up or take some exams right. and some... Yeah, so we take every two... You, we have to take CLEs, right? Continuing legal education courses. So every two years, we can, um, you know, show that we are, you know, we're staying abreast. We're staying current mm-hmm. on the law. So we're required to do that. So you're up to date mm-hmm. with the policies and, and things. apart from that... Yeah, separate and apart from my practice of law and you know what I do in a professional capacity, in terms of within the Congress now, within Rastafari community, as I said, I write. And I, I used to write a lot more frequently than I do now. I just simply don't have the time because I'm always working, I'm telling you. And so, um, but I wanted to start a series, my Lord, um, you know, start sending out, I, I wanted to talk about um, where is the racism, because I find that when we talk about a lot of times when we talk about racism mm-hmm. these days, people are saying, "What we talking about racism?" Mm. You know, look at all the progress that Black people have made. Mm-hmm. We have had a Black president of the United States. You have had a Black Attorney General. You have had a Black this, that, that, that. All kinds of things, right? All these um, you do, you you would say, you know, they're just um figurehead sort of our <sighs> token, right? And I'm saying, but. Racism still continues today. And so what I'm seeking to do is to point out the ways in which racism continues to, um, you know, invade society. How it continues to reside in the system and the, and the, the ways, the, the way, day to day. How it affects your life, your life opportunities, your life chances, whether you live or you die. Whether you get rich or you don't get rich, whether you're able to support yourself, you know, it racism is so it is so ingrained into the society. And that's the genius of the white man, you know, that he's doing something to you and you're not even you don't even realize it. And in many and in many ways, you are participating in your own oppression. Mm-hmm. Because let me tell you something. What they have done to us overtly, they have done worse to us covertly. Mm-hmm. Whatever they have done to us blatantly, they are doing worse to us under the cover. You understand? And the purpose of my article is to, or the series of articles that I intend to put out, is to show the various ways, the specific ways in which racism manifests itself in the everyday functioning of society and how it influences and affects the life chances of black people. Right? In every facet. Things that appear normal to you is actually not normal. It's manufactured. It's part of the, the racist fabric of society. And why is that important? It is important, my Lord, because, right? You will say, oh, you're giving people all kind of crutch and all kind of excuse as for their own failure or for their lack of, you know, their inability to um, advance and to achieve. No, we're not giving um, excuses. You see, an uninformed people cannot make an informed decision. That is right. An uninformed people cannot make 
an, in, uh, an informed decision. So people need to see uh, how the system is working against them. They need to see how despite all of their efforts, they mean they're unable to make any headway. They're unable to progress in the way that they had imagined. They need to know the source of their pain and suffering. They need to know why they cannot advance despite their unrelenting efforts to do so. By becoming aware of the ways in which the system conspires against them, black people will be better able to respond to and counteract all the darts and the arrows that are aimed against us. And so, as I said, I used to write a whole lot more, but because of the demands of my of my profession and my job, I'm unable to do so, but I do um, intend to do this series because once again, we need to um, remind, remind ourselves and each other the ways in which the system continues to operate to keep us down. And you know, if somebody show you where the minefields are, then you can better avoid them. That is right. Yes. Yes, sir. Well, so that is the purpose of that. So on that note, my lord. Yeah, the the, the platform is here, and um, yeah, we can um, you know section a part of the uh, you know of those videos you know so people can you know see that it's a series and yeah we can we can we can make that happen man we can make that happen yes i give thanks i give thanks my lord i think that would be but you know what for the work that you're doing for the work that you're doing give thanks and um yes our community needs it um our race needs it everyone has to play their part and I give thanks that I can, yes. you know, I can play my, my part, you know. Yeah. Yes, my lord. If anyone asks, yes, what indeed. did you do, you know, towards contributing, you know, I can say, boy, you know, me did I do a whole part talking still, but, you know. But, yes. Yeah. But, yes, Honorable yes, Empress, it's, you know, it's been great um, reasoning and listening um, to the eye and, you know, the information that the eye have. You know to share you know it's it's just um it's just beautiful you know it's it's um it's refreshing trust me yeah and we give thanks you know for such um eloquent you know and you know the way that i articulate you know those different different um moments and their journey still so we give thanks you know and and continue to do the great work i think you know you're doing a, a uh it's more than a great work you know when you can help people to you know to have a foothold you know in 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 a place where you know it's it's designed to be against them you know i think you know yes. it, it, they are doing a, a great job you know in terms of getting people to you know legally can work and you know get back in the country and you know reunited with them family and and kids and you know that is that is great so you know i commend the eye and i continue um i would you know said today i continue to do to do that help that you're helping not just your your people but you know rest of people also you know continue to do that because that 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 is good you know people need help and once someone is there to give a helping hand yeah and the eye is doing that so continue and you know more strength and you know more blessing in 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 what you're doing yes my lord give thanks thank you so very much and as i said you know right back at you you know commend yes, you I. for the great work that you're doing give thanks commend you. yes give my thanks. lord honorable majesty yes honorable give thanks for the yeah for the time yeah but, give thanks yes yes <laughs> All right, my lord, we'll be in touch. Yes, honorable. Yeah, man, more love, more strength. And um, yes, you know, my lord. All, all, all the best. All the best. All the Bless best. And love. Bless and love, my lord. Yes, honorable empress. Give thanks again, you know. Yes, sir. Yes, indeed. Yes, yes sir. Bless and love. Yeah, man, peace and love. Rastafari. Yes, honorable family. So, dear, yeah, there we have it. You know, the item can. Um, reason with we i know that was a whole leap you know what i mean yeah more than a cup full you know so 
yeah man reason with we in the comment section and um yeah let me know your views and thoughts and you know what's been said here you know what i mean and please remember to you know to like the video that's that's important you know like the video yeah man very important that the item do so see it so manners and respect peace and love holy man will i king celestia ja rastafari see you in the next video start the mindset smash that subscribe button see you on the next video i guess start the mindset